This is the Redemption Church Podcast. For a list of messages, events, and more, please visit experienceredemption.com. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Here is today's message. Good morning. Well, if you're new around here, my name is Stephen. Thank you for uh, being here this morning. I'm the pastor. And uh, if you were new last week, you got to hear Mike preach. And Mike did an amazing job preaching on joy. And uh, he's always just a blast to have down. Uh, and I don't know if he announced this in the first service. He did in the second service. Uh, Mike's going to be planning a church next year, and uh, we're super excited about that. We're super excited as a church to see however it is that we can help. And I know he said this in the second service, but he didn't say it in the first service. Uh, over the last couple of weeks and months, he's been texting me. He's like, dude, what should I name my church? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I've only ever had one good idea. So I don't really know what to tell you. Uh, and so anyway, like two weeks ago, he texted me finally. He's like, I'm just going to name it Redemption Church Detroit. And I said, that sounds good to me, man. So that's what he's going to name it. So it's like we get to kind of be a part uh, of what he's going to be doing up there. We'll talk a lot more about that over the next couple of weeks and months and uh, how we might be able to help Mike and how you guys might be able to help Mike as well. Um, but he's become a good friend of the church. And so if you were here last week uh, for the first time, I'm glad you came back. Today, I'm going to continue on in our series. Uh, it's titled, His Name Shall Be Called. And uh, we'll, of course, conclude this next Sunday on Christmas Eve, 9, 11, and 1 o'clock. And uh, next Sunday, I'm going to preach through those four famous names. They're highlighted in the song that we sang to open up the service today. And we'll look at each of the names and, and what they mean for each of us and uh, how Jesus came not to be distant, but to be so close and personal. And so next week, we'll look into that. Today, what I want to do is I want to look at these two verses, verses four and five. And I would say out of this famous passage, and if you've got a Bible, you can follow along. Out of this famous uh, prophetic passage, these two verses are probably the two hardest to understand. Uh, I, I think as we read them and as we try to understand them in the context that they're laid out, uh, sometimes you can walk away and go, well, what exactly does that mean? What was uh, the, the Holy Spirit trying to communicate through the prophet in these two verses? And what about the tumult and the blood and the fire and all of these types of things? And so what I want to do here uh, is I want to just talk about three things that the, these two verses tell us about Jesus. Three things that they tell us about what Jesus does or what Jesus did, what he does now and what he will continue to do, and then what he will ultimately do when he makes his return. And so I think they're, they're right here in the text. Uh, they're not really even hidden. They're, they're out there in plain sight. And so we're going to look at three things this morning that Jesus does. Let me uh, start by just reading again verse 4. For the yoke of his burden... And the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken. The first thing that this teaches us about what Jesus does, and, and by the way, uh, remember the context here of, uh, am I making noise? It doesn't like my felt jacket. What the heck? Okay. Well, we'll see how this continues. Uh, the, the, the reminder here of what the text has uh, taught us already. Uh, the beginning of Isaiah 9, coming right at the end of Isaiah 8, kind of lays out this darkness. Uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, it said that the world was, uh, it, these weren't the exact words, but it described this, that the world was spiritually hangry, uh, it was hungry and enraged, and it was that way, and as a result of it, it began to lash out. The world would lash out in its spiritual hunger, it would produce a darkness, but then into that, the promised Messiah is made. And so then the, the promise of the Messiah occurs, and this is, of course is Christ. And uh, once the Messiah comes, light, the Messiah will break into the darkness that will produce an immediate joy. Joy will then be produced. And uh, after the joy, that's what Mike talked about last week. After the joy is produced, then we see here in verse 4 and 5, what's next? Well, what, what does this joy do? Well, it comes in and it produces a freedom. See, the first thing this teaches us about Jesus is this, that Jesus came to bring freedom. Jesus came to bring freedom. Now, in our uh, modern understanding of freedom is really messed up. And all over the place, we hear uh, people talk about, well, freedom this and freedom that. And the modern world's understanding of freedom is this. I should be able to do whatever I want. And freedom looks like me being able to choose 
whatever my little heart desires. And if my heart tells me that I should do that, I should follow my heart and I should be free to be able to do that. In fact, one of the, the modern uh, like pushbacks against Christianity is they would say it's so restricting. Now, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to preach a whole sermon on freedom because it's actually a word that we use in our mission statement around here, which is to help all people experience redemption and live in freedom. And so we're going to talk about what does living in freedom look like. So you get a snapshot of it this morning. Uh, one of my favorite metaphors for Christian freedom is this. Imagine a fish. And the fish is in the ocean, and the fish is complaining that uh, this little fishy in his little heart, he doesn't want to be in the ocean anymore. And so the fish is complaining because uh, his heart just doesn't find himself free in the ocean and says, I want out, and I want to be on the land, and I want to be free to roam the land as much as I want to roam the land. And the fishy's parents, because uh, the internet told them to do this, says, okay, little uh, fish, go roam the land and be free. How long is that going to last? Not real long, right? Not real long. In fact, this is true. The fish is actually more free to be a fish in a small aquarium than to roam the entire plains of our country. Why? Because freedom is not about doing whatever you want, following your heart. Freedom is about being able to do and be who God has created you to be. That's freedom. That's freedom. I've been posting a little bit on Facebook about following your heart. And sometimes there's pushback on that. Um, that wasn't even supposed to be a joke. That's great. Free laughs. Um, and yes, the Lord redeems our heart. Like, he, uh, he changes our heart. He gives us a new heart. But when the scriptures talk about us being free, one of the things it's talking about us being free from is the old heart. The, the old way of thinking that says, I should be able to do what I want. Galatians says it this way, Galatians chapter 5, for freedom, this is Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, in the scriptures, uh, the yoke of slavery is twofold. There are two things that our hearts can become prone to being enslaved to. And when we say that Jesus came to be uh, to set us free, we're talking about these two types of freedom. Uh, freedom number one is the yoke of religious slavery. And uh, freedom number two is the yoke of slavery um, from being enslaved to sin. Uh, Paul calls it our inner memory. Members are our fleshly desires. And in Christ, we are set free from both of those. Acts 15, 10. If you've got a Bible, you can flip a little bit uh, back. Acts 15, 10, Paul says this. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? What Paul was saying there early on in the history of the church, he was looking at the, the church leaders and he was saying, why is it that you're trying to create in this faith, in this beautiful gift of grace that God has given us, why are you trying now to throw on it layer after layer after layer or uh, tightening the yoke or putting on the weight of religious burden on these people that have been set free by the gospel? G uh, said another way, Paul is kind of saying this, as somebody who has emerged out of being a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, as somebody who has been really good at practicing religion, why are you trying to return people back to that kind of dead faith? Sometimes there's a misunderstanding. People will say this. They'll say, oh, people in the Old Testament, well, they were saved by the law. True or false? False? No. No one's ever been saved by the law. Why? Because we've all failed underneath the law, right? We have always been saved by the goodness of God. Always. And, uh, and, and what happens sometimes in Christianity uh, is that people, they enter into Christ, 
right? And, and they experience conversion. And then the yoke of slavery gets to be placed back on. Some of you, you still struggle with this. You are in Christ but you still sit under this weight, this heaviness, right, of, um, of religious adherence. Now, don't get me wrong. What I'm not saying is that we are not called to obey or that we're not called to live under the rule of God because even sometimes Christians will incorrectly use the follow your heart, right? And, and so what they'll do uh, is they will say, well, I'm in Christ now, I'm following my heart, I can do whatever it is that I wanna do, I'm free in Christ, and I'm not under the law, and they use that as an excuse to sin. That's bad. Paul warns us of that specifically in Romans 6. But at the same time, what we're also not supposed to do is step into Christ and then layer ourselves back underneath the, the restriction of the law or the requirements of the law in order to be acceptable before God. Now, some of us this morning, we just need to simply be reminded in Christ, the joy and the beauty of God's grace. Some of we like, you get so like caught up in yourself sometimes and your ability to obey that it almost becomes crippling. Just remind yourself, Jesus did all the obedience for you, paid the price of the law so that you could be set free in Christ and now by the power of his Holy Spirit, walk in your obedience. This is the first way of freedom. And sometimes I'll have conversations with people, emails or, or conversations, and I'll look at people and say, you know what? You just need to repent of your Pharisee nature a little bit. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Sometimes this plays out in how we evaluate other people, by the way. We get so caught up in like, well, well, look at her and look at she. Oh, look what they posted on Facebook and look what they did and look what they wore and look at this and look at that. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Let God's grace work. Let the Holy Spirit move in. Does this, are, are we um, saying that sin is okay? No, of course not. But you gotta walk in freedom. Second thing, second thing that we're supposed to walk in freedom from is this. We're supposed to walk in freedom from the enslavement of sin. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25. Paul says it this way. He says, so I find it to be a law. Now, whenever Paul uses the word law, we always think he's talking about the Old Testament law. He's not talking about that here. What he's talking about is this. He's talking about like uh, a principle, okay? So, uh, so I find it to be a principle that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Okay, I kid you not. All right, I walk, I, I, I've been injured, my back's been injured, okay? So exercise has been a little bit more difficult, all right? I, I stepped on the scale this morning, didn't feel great about it, and I thought, all right, I gotta do this week differently. I walked into my office, and there was like 12,000 calories of cookies sitting on my desk. <laughs> this, this verse living itself out, all right? I want to do what is right, but puppy chow lies close at hand. Amen? Amen. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul is saved while he's writing this, by the way. He's not talking about his pre-redeemed self. He's talking about his, he's in, his in Christ self. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. What's he saying? He's saying there's a battle that is still going on. And he's saying, I'm finding myself prone to fall back into these, these, uh, these, these sinful desires, these, these fleshly temptations. And uh, Paul is looking, he's saying, I hate it, and I want to do what is right, and I do delight in God. How do we know Paul is saved here? Because no one delights in God in their inner being before they're redeemed, right? That's the clue. Paul says, I delight in the Lord in my inner being. Okay, only a follower of Christ can delight in God. And he says, but as I'm delighting in God on one hand, there's this other thing that is warring against me. 
And some of you, you might be in the middle of this fight right now where you are, you're in Christ and you want to grow, you want to be sanctified, you want to be up in Christ, but there's like a war that is being, uh, that, that is waging for your soul, right? And, and you sense and you feel the battle. And the reminder of Isaiah uh, 9, 4 is this, that Christ came to set you free from that. Second Peter reminds us, uh, in, uh, in 2 Peter 19, you can read it on your own later, but, but Peter basically is saying this. I'm going to summarize the verse. He, he's saying that what the world says will lead to freedom actually leads to enslavement. And what the Bible says will lead to freedom leads to an enslavement to righteousness, which actually produces the real freedom that we need. What it's also telling us all throughout 2 Peter there, chapter 2, you can read it on your own later, uh, is that uh, we believe that when we are in Christ, there is not a single sin that is more powerful than grace. That there is not a single thing, my friend, that you are dealing with. There is not a pattern. There is not a habit. There is not an inclination that is more powerful than the gospel. That we can be changed and set free from anything. By the way, here's another modern lie. A lot of times people, um, what we're trying to do right now in our modern um, um, understanding of doctrine is we're trying to disconnect a couple of things. We're trying to disconnect desires with actions. And we're trying to say, well, sinful desires are okay as long as you don't act upon them. That's wrong. Mostly this emerged because of homosexuality and conversation around it, where people wanted to say, well, it's okay to be homosexual as long as you don't act upon it. Like, it's okay to, to, uh, to, to be um, uh, attracted, right, to the same sex. It's okay to carry those desires. It's okay to, to let them, as long as you don't act. This has never been accepted doctrine, by the way, until about 20 years ago. Like, if I stood up here today and I was like, it's okay, um, husband, to be attracted to other women and sexually desirous of them as long as you don't act upon them. Ladies, you cool with that? No. 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 No, we repent at the desire level. That's where we, you got, we got to go deep. Do we repent at the action level? Yes. Oh, but then we unwind. You got to repent at the desire level. And some of us, by the way, right now what you're trying to do in your changing behavior is you are just trying to deal with the behavior out here and you're not dealing with what's in here. And so that's why you keep repeating. You've got to take it a little bit deeper. What is that desire that is that war with God's goodness. You gotta repent at that level. That's when transformation really comes, right? And Christ came to set us free. Have you been struggling with the same thing for a while? Have you had repeated conversations with a friend, a, a counselor, a spouse? And you go, I just can't change. I just can't be different. You are believing a lie. You can be. You can change. The entire message of the gospel is predicated on the belief that you can change. Repent at that level and let the gospel change you from there. Let Christ set you free. One of the most um, fun things to do in the Christian life is to see how God has changed you in something. Look back and go, wow, look how far he has taken me. Look how far he has taken me. There are things in my life that I can look back at now and, and, and see 19-year-old me, 20-year-old me, 21-year-old me, right? And at and, and, and 20, 21, whatever, I would have never thought I could have lived in the freedom that I live in now. And by God's grace, let him change you down there. Let him change you down there. Christ came to set you free. All right, that's number one. Let's look at the second thing that Christ came to do back in our passage. Let me make sure I hit everything I wanted to. Yep. Second thing, how will he do it? He says, you 
have broken all of those things, the rod, the staff, and the yoke. You have broken them as on the day of Midian. You don't have to yell it out quickly. Hold on. Just think in your head. The day of Midian. What story is he talking about? You don't know, Got it? Okay. Gideon. That's what story he's talking about. It's a, it's a direct reference back to the story of Gideon in Judges 6 and 7, right? And in Judges 6 and 7, uh, we see the Israelites, they're under uh, oppression, right, by the Midianites. And uh, just a quick reminder here and a tip on reading your Bible. As you're reading your Bible, particularly the Old Testament, there's a couple of things you got to remember. Um, the first is we believe the Bible. That's one of our stated values, right? So we believe that where the stories are to be interpreted literally, which is almost the entire Old Testament, right? We interpret them and believe them to be literal. So there's physical things. But then when you read the New Testament, what we see is that we are also able to understand them as spiritual principles. And so they're literal stories, yes. And the New Testament authors refer to them as literal stories, right? By the way, the New Testament authors refer to creation as literal, refer to Noah's Ark as literal, okay? Like over and over, the New Testament authors are referring back to them, so we believe them to be literal, right? But then there are also there are these pictures. And so when you're reading the Old Testament, right, you're, you're, you're asking yourself, okay, this really happened. Let me understand the story. What's the spiritual principle involved? And then you're asking, how does this point me to Jesus? That's how we read through the Old Testament, right? And so he's talking about this story of Gideon. And in this story of Gideon, Judges 6 and 7, uh, they're under um, harsh oppression. They're under harsh oppression, and uh, they're terrified. It's harvest season, and um, basically like a bully at lunch, the Midianites, every harvest season, come on in, and they steal the Israelites' lunch. That's how it happens. And so uh, it's, it's lunchtime, and Gideon is in the threshing floor. He's hiding out, and an angel shows up and says, hey, Gideon. And Gideon's like, who are you talking to? He says, I'm talking to you. And he says, oh, mighty man of valor. And Gideon kind of looks and goes, are you talking to me? Because right now I'm terrified and I'm hiding. And he was. And he says, I want you to be a warrior. I want you to be a warrior. And so Gideon gathers 30,000. God whittles it down to 10,000. Then he whittles it down even more to 300. 1% of what he started with, Right? And, and Gideon then, and these 300 guys, they go and they fight Midian, who have been terrorizing them for years. And you know how they win? By shouting and by banging on pots and pans. They basically acted like August, <laughs> my son, okay? Like next time he does that, I'm gonna be like, watch out neighbors, you might die, okay? <laughs> He's teaching us something. What was it? that Jesus will deliver an improbable victory in a paradoxical fashion. Over and over in the scriptures, Jesus will deliver an improbable victory in a paradoxical fashion. And right now today, you might be looking for victory in something in your life, victory over sin, uh, victory uh, in, in, in relationship, right? And by the way, remember, victory is always what God wanted, not what you wanted, okay? Um, but, but some type of victory in your life. And we tend to have this idea of how that's going to play out and how that's going to look. And what the scriptures teach us over and over and over is that God will deliver the victory when it's in alignment with his will. But almost every Every time he is going to do it in a very paradoxical fashion in a way that we look and go wow I didn't see that one coming in fact isn't it true that as you look back at the years of your life and you see the victories that God has produced in your life that so oftentimes you look back and you go well, I didn't see that coming and isn't it also true that we're in the middle of the fight when we're in the middle of the battle, whether it is the internal fight for our righteousness, um, it's the more external fight with those that are closest to us, or it's the fights that are out there uh, that oftentimes uh, when we're in the middle of the fight, we're looking for our own solutions. We're trying to figure it out on our own. And what the story is teaching us is that God does want to walk you into freedom. He does want to deliver a victory. Victory, but he will often do it in a paradoxical way. And so what are you supposed to do in the process? Worship and wait, right? And you worship and you wait and you work. But you realize the way he's going to do it 
is probably not the way you would have done it. Let me give you a couple of examples in the scriptures. How did God bring forth his people? By making a 90-year-old and a 100-year-old conceive a child. That's why some of you grandparents out there, we're still praying for you, okay? (laughs) Wow. You can come up afterwards for a prayer if you want. How did he feed his people in the wilderness? By sending manna from heaven. How did he destroy Jericho? By having them march around the walls. How did he preserve his line in the time of famine? Through the faithfulness of a widower. Whom did he pick to be his king? The forgotten shepherd boy. How did he rescue the Israelites from Haman's genocide? Through a beauty pageant. How did he enter into the world? Through the virgin birth of a teenager. How did he propel his movement? Through service, not authority. Who did he say would inherit the earth? The peacemaker, not the warrior. How did he say to treat our enemies? To love them, not hate them. What did he do to the abandoned leper? He hugged him. How did he conquer sin? By dying himself. How did he defeat death? By rising from the grave. How did he launch his church? Through the feeble voices of fallen men. To whom did he pick as his great apostle? The one of whom had persecuted him the most. What has this church done to this day despite all the darkness of the world aimed against it? It has never fallen, never been stopped, and never will. Amen. That is the God of the paradox. And he will deliver an improbable victory. But he most often does it in a paradoxical fashion. And so what do we do in the waiting? We worship And we work. We worship him as we're doing it. We do all that we can on our earthly, uh, by our earthly means, but we trust him ultimately to deliver the victory that only he can deliver. And so maybe today you're in this place and you're like, I've been praying for a victory. We've been praying for something for for weeks or months or years. And you feel like you're in the battle right now and you're waiting for it. Let me tell you, he will often do it in a way that is a paradox. How will he elevate you? When you humble yourself. When will you sense him the most? Often when you are at your lowest. When do you receive in this life? When you give. When do you find life? Jesus says, when you lose it. When does joy appear? When you obey and deny your feelings, not embrace them. How do you find peace? When you follow him, not your heart. When are you strong? When you are weak. When does light shine the brightest? When it has become the darkest. How will you rise? when you die to him and are risen in Christ. This is the God of the paradox. And so often how he works and what Isaiah is reminding us of is that he will bring an improbable victory. He can bring an improbable victory, but it is likely that you're gonna look back and go, well, I didn't see that one coming. What's the third thing? What's the third thing this text teaches us? Verse five. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. What beautiful language, isn't it? Every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult. I was thinking through my notes and like what a title for this sermon could be. And um, what the title that came to me is The Joyous But Bloodied Warrior. And this verse right here, verse 5, uh, what it's talking about is it's talking about being engaged in the fight. It's talking about every person who is now in Christ that is engaged in some kind of battle. And the battles, uh, like I've, I've talked about already, uh, sometimes the battles are internal. They're, they're, they're battles with the heart, uh, they're battles with the mind, they're battles with the soul. Sometimes the, the battle is a little bit more out here. Uh, it, it's a battle that you feel like you're uh, with a spouse or with a loved one or with a friend or with a child or uh, whatever it might be. And, uh, and so it's a little bit further out 
out here. And then sometimes the battles are out there. It's like the battle that you feel like you're engaged in and we're collectively engaged in, right? To see righteousness win in our world and to uh, see truth restored to the public square. And, and you go, well, how do you fight? How do we fight these battles? And, 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 and what does it look like um, that when I'm, when I'm getting bloodied and, uh, and, and when I'm tired, how do I keep the fight going? Why? Because what does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants us in the middle of the fight to quit, to abandon hope, to abandon the right path, to, to step off and to be done, to be dejected, to look and to say, oh, they'll never change or, uh, or it will always be this way. Or, um, well, I guess we might as well just give up and uh, there's nothing else for, for us to do. And this verse right here, I think, is a powerful reminder of continuing to fight. He shows two things. He says there's the boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult. In other words, there's just the constant or consistent marching. Like, like just not giving up or giving in. Like, like the person who just keeps walking and like, God, I am fighting this sin. I am fighting this thing that's inside of me, um, but I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to turn back. I am going to keep marching. It's the spouse in the marriage, right? That's like, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. God, this is hard, but I'm going to keep marching. It's the parent that is praying for the child and it hurts and you feel bloody, right? Because the battle has been hard and you want to quit and it seems like blood is everywhere and you're just like, I'm not going to quit. I am going to keep marching. I am going to keep loving them. I am going to keep parenting. I am going to keep praying. I'm not going to give in. It's the battle of those who look out at the world right now and go, yeah, truth has stumbled in the public square, but Jesus said he would come and bring an improbable victory, and so I'm not going to give up. I'm just going to keep marching. I'm going to keep marching. And in the fight, in the Christian fight, there's always going to be blood, right? And if you came to Christ in a weird, um, like, doctrinal uh, perspective that told you that the moment you stepped into Christ, uh, that there wasn't going to be any problems anymore, newsflash, that was wrong. You believed a lie. And there is modern teaching around that, that once you step into Christ, there will be no more battle. It's not even like, even understanding like um, when the Israelites got into uh, the promised land, did they walk into the promised land and everything was taken care of? No, there's an entire book of the Bible, which I would say is like the entire life of the believer, where they had to keep fighting every step, every step. Peter says this, and Paul, they both say this, share in suffering, share in suffering. There's, no, there's nothing in the scriptures, right, as you read them in their, uh, in their comprehensive nature that could get you to the end and say that being in the Christian life is not going to be a battle. Not Jesus, not the apostles, not the Old Testament, nothing about reading the scriptures would make you arrive, if you read all of them, would make you arrive at the conclusion that um, suffering or difficulty or battle is somehow an indicator that God doesn't love you, right, or uh, that you're not praying hard enough or you, don't, you just don't have enough faith. No, no. In fact, the people with the most faith, like in Hebrews chapter 11, they're written into the, uh, people refer to it as the hall of faith. It's the great faith chapter. And most of what Hebrews 11 does is it chronicalizes people who didn't lose faith despite all of the difficulty they faced. What it doesn't say is this. You don't get into the hall of faith because you had so much faith and you knew how to pray that you never faced difficulty. No, you get into the hall of faith because even when difficulty was there, even when you were in the battle, you never lost faith. That's how. The battle is tough. And it is bloody. And some of you, maybe, you look out and you're like, man, I kind of had a bloodied week. 
I had a bloodied week, right, with your spouse. You had a, a bloodied week uh, with your sin. You had a, a, a bloodied week. You were like looking out at the world too much and you saw everything going on and you're like, oh my goodness, right? And you're like, man, it feels like it's kind of been bloody. It feels like it's been hard. It feels like the battle is waging and, and I don't know how to, I don't know if I can keep going. How do I keep fighting? How do we keep, how do I keep going? Well, like I said earlier, first the fight is internal. And the scriptures always teach us this, right? That we, we are to be set apart in Christ, that we're to win the battles going on here first, and we're, we're to allow the gospel to break in. And so some of you right now, you might be still fighting that war inside of you. Maybe you're fighting your pharisaical tendencies. Maybe you're fighting that old sin nature. You're fighting that desire still to run after the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, right? You're fighting apathy. You're fighting bitterness. You're fighting greed, right? And you need to go back in and say, okay, yeah, it is a hard fight, but it's a fight worth winning. How do we fight? Well, four things. First, we are to fight with an unwavering confidence. Why? Because greater is he that is in us than is he, than he that is in the world. Then over and over in the battle, when we are fighting these things, when you're walking through the season, when you're trying to see the end story, you, you do fight, and we do fight with a confidence, right, that we can do it, we can walk it out. The, the scriptures tell us that everything you and I need for godliness, we have been given in the moment of our salvation. We have been granted to it by the promises of God, and First uh, Peter reminds us, everything you need for godliness has been bestowed stowed upon you. Now, you might still need to learn how to exercise all of it. You might still need to learn how to use it all, but it has been granted to you. And so when we fight in the battle, when we're marching, when we're bloodied, we realize everything I have, God has already given to me. He's given me the riches of it. And so I can fight with the confidence. And sometimes you just need a reminder of that. You need a reminder of that by a verse that you read. You need a reminder of that by just getting into church every week where somebody like me can tell you, like, listen, no, 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 no. You can do it. Like Christ in you can do it, right? You can change, husband. You can change, wife. You can change. Person who has been struggling with their identity, and finding it in, uh, and actually finding it in Christ, you can't change from the pattern and the habit that has been around. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? And so you fight with a confidence, friend, that the person you are a year from today does not have to be the same person that you are today. Second way you fight is what? Well, you fight with hope. You fight with hope. You, and the text tells us this at the end. It says, it says this, it says, all of it will be burned in the fire. What will be burned in the fire? The, the old uniform covered and stained in blood, the boots worn down by the years of marching, the, the, the outfit covered and uh, clothed in tears. He said, all of it, it will be burned in the fire at the end. In other words, God's going to take all of the, the battle, all of the agony, all of the persevering, all of these things that you were like, I'm just going to keep marching, I'm going to keep marching, I'm going to keep waging the war, I'm going to keep battling, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to remain obedient, I'm going to keep letting him change me. He's going to take all of it that surrounds all of it, all of the pain, all of everything like that, and at the end, it's going to be burned up in the fire, and what's going to be replaced with that is you're going to be given a new uniform stained by no blood, where there are no tears, there is no death, and all of it is gone and you just live in the glorious light of Christ. Oh, and so you, you, you fight the battle in hope. You fight on in hope because you know what awaits you. That one day, right, the, the bloody uniform's coming off and you're going to get a new one clothed in Jesus. So you, you fight or you battle in confidence. You battle in hope. Here's another thing too. You battle not with each other, but alongside each other. Hebrews 3.13, one of my favorite verses is this. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that you not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.13. And what it is, is it's this constant reminder to, uh, to, uh, to be fighting alongside each other. 
to have people in our life that are pointing out, that are helping us walk in the battle. And the only way you can do this, one, is if you're um, at some point in time in your life vulnerable enough to let somebody else in to help you with the battle. And the other way, uh, the other thing that has to be present is you have to continue to at least show up in a place where other people can help you walk through it. But we fight alongside each other. And, uh, and part of the body of Christ from the very beginning, one of the points of it has been is that we would have each other walking through all of the battles and all of the fights in life uh, so that we know that we're not fighting them alone. One of the things the enemy wants to do more than anything else is to isolate you and to make you think that you're the only one who understands or you're the only one that is fighting the battle. And you're not. And you aren't. And so you fight alongside each other. And then what's the last thing in how we fight? Well, it's been the theme of the previous verse and last week. Somehow in all of this, we fight with joy. Like that, that even though we are blooded, even though we're tired because we've been marching through life and the battles are coming and, and sometimes it feels like we win and sometimes we feel like we lose and, uh, and sometimes it hurts and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and no one escapes this, right? No one escapes this. Like some of us think like, oh, I've made it this far. And then all of a sudden, just like that, right? The job goes or, or the kid turns astray or something. Like none of us escape the battle. None of us escape the blood, right? But he says in the midst of all of that, somehow it's like almost kind of a gruesome picture. But the picture is of the bloodied warrior marching through the battles of life and somehow remaining joyous. This is not to um, downplay or to disregard any type of sorrow or mourning when real bad things happen. Like as Christians, we experience the fullness of our emotion and that's okay. But in the midst of all of it, somehow we still walk in joy. A friend of mine posted the other day that joy is one of the greatest apologetics. Apologetics. That like somehow when the world looks and sees the Christian's joy, they go, I don't get it. I don't get it. Help me understand that. And where do we learn this from, by the way? Oh, uh, we learn it from the bloodied warrior, Christ himself, who it says, face the cross, the blood of the cross. He didn't even have boots on, right? They just nailed through his feet. He faced the blood of the cross, but the scriptures tell us what? For the joy set before it, for him, he endured it, right? That he was the first joyous, bloodied warrior. That as he walked through and as he faced all that we... And why did he go to the cross, by the way? To deliver an improbable victory in the most paradoxical of fashions so that you and I could be delivered and walk in our freedom, right? And so then what? So then what? As Christians, what do we do? We embrace what Christ did for us. We embrace the beauty of that gospel. We allow that freedom then to work its way into us so that we can walk in freedom from our, from our religion and freedom from sin. So that we can walk out and see God deliver victories in our lives. Yes, deliver victory out there in these uh, uh, improbable victories, in these paradoxical ways. But we keep on marching and fighting. And somehow, and how? By, by the beauty of Christ, by the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of you. You never lose your joy. You never lose your joy. You just keep somehow the joyous, bloodied warrior. See, the prophecy here in Isaiah chapter 9, it points us to ultimately what is going to be fulfilled in Christ. And it's showing us right here, right? Jesus is going to come. Light's going to break in. Joy's going to take out. The battle is still going to be tough. And then next week, I want to conclude it. And tell you, I want to give you four things that Jesus wants to do for you in the middle of the battle, even beyond what we've talked about today. But I want to wrap up today by praying, wherever you might be on this journey that we talked about this morning, would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you that you sent Jesus to set us free. And so, Father, I pray right now for anyone in here who has not yet been set free in Christ. Lord, they are still enslaved to their sin. I pray that the, the message of your gospel would just be so clear to them right now that they would walk out of that slavery into the glorious freedom that you have for them. Father, I pray for anyone in here that is enslaved by their religion, the desire that they still have, the inward struggle that they still have to have to do everything right, to always be perfect, to try to earn your grace and favor. 
Lord, would you help them to rest this morning in what you already did for them? And Father, I know there are many in here. They're in the middle of the fight. They've got to fight for their marriage. They've got to fight for their sin. They've got to fight over the child. They've got to fight that you have them engaged in. And it gets bloody. And so, Lord, I pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you infuse them with new life today? Would you give them hope, confidence, and joy? Would you surround them with the right people to walk with them through it? And Father, would you help them to walk in it, to trust you, and Father, to wait for you to bring the victory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for today's message. For more information, you can visit Experience Redemption on Instagram or Facebook for updates, service times, and ways you can get connected. Want to partner and support the work of Redemption Church? You can give online at experienceredemption.com slash give online to explore your giving options. We also stream services on both YouTube and Facebook Live, so be sure to join us and share your experience. Thanks for checking out the podcast. We will see you soon.